Episode number one, On Point with Stuart Kaplan and Chris Byhoda. And this is kind of a uh, new endeavor for myself and certainly for my uh, co-host, Chris Byhoda. Um, I will tell you, uh, this show is going to hopefully be very, very different than most podcasts. Um, I've been asked for a long, long time, hey, Stuart, uh, we see you all over TV and you really should have a podcast. And I kind of poo-pooed it and kind of put it in, you know, uh, put it on the back burner. Um, and then more recently, um, I just thought the timing was right. And quite frankly, uh, the title of the podcast, On Point with Stuart Kaplan and, and Chris Bihoda, uh Chris and I could probably spend several days in, in trying to tell you why the program is named On Point, but I will concede that, quite frankly, we couldn't figure out a great name for what we are trying to accomplish, and so we settled with On Point. I will tell you that this program is going to attempt to educate you, inform you, hopefully move you, and maybe even most importantly, try to keep you, your family, your loved ones, and your friends and family safer as we all embark on this new world. And that would include, for example, going on a simple vacation, whether overseas or domestically, or sending the kids off to school, or going to church, or going to synagogue, or unfortunately, as a simple task of just going to the supermarket or sending your children on a bike ride to the local park. Uh, I will spend some time uh, during the programs uh, to introduce myself or to some of you who know me, uh, reintroduce myself. Uh, but I want to take the time to introduce my co-host. And quite frankly, uh, the irony of Chris Pihoda deciding and willing to endeavor or go into this with me is just, it is my honor. I am privileged to have him on board with me. Chris Pihoda retired from the FBI as an executive assistant director. Um, that means that the only person above him, quite frankly, was the director. And so I can tell you without hesitation, Chris swam in the fishbowl and really understands what it is like to work at the FBI. And hopefully, uh, as these episodes uh, evolve, really educate you and shape you and get you to understand the real context of what truly goes on at the FBI and what the FBI does and how the FBI uh, affects how we live our lives here in the United States and abroad. Um, I can also tell you that Chris was the uh, director of the Terrorist Screening Center. That is a facility that was located or is located in Quantico, Virginia. That's where the FBI Academy is and really understands and really will inform you as to why it is in 2024, we really are embarking on some dangerous times uh, for all of us. And so without further ado, Chris Byhoda, my former roommate, class 9513, that seems like a long time ago. How are you, my colleague and my friend? I'm doing well, Stu, and thanks for that intro. And if it seems long ago, it's because it was, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, no, thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate it. And it's a, it's an honor to be here. And I uh, hope, like you said, we can share some insights and ideas and from our both of our backgrounds and help some folks maybe get a clearer picture on why some things happen, why they don't. And, uh, you know, we will call BS when it's BS and and then help people kind of make their way through what's going on today. And I also want to tell uh, the viewing audience that I, I uh, tend to use language uh, that sometimes may be offensive. But look, I'm born and raised in the Bronx, and sometimes uh, F-bombs will come out of my mouth. I am somewhat passionate, uh, you know, and so uh, I uh, will ask you to, uh, if it offends you, to excuse it. It is not meant 
to insult you or to insult my integrity. Uh, it's just at times there are certain things that I think uh, somewhat cause me to be somewhat animated. And so, uh, again, this is going to be very different because both Chris and I are both former FBI agents. And I think that, you know, stere stereotypically people have an impression of what an FBI agent should look like or what he should sound like or whether or not, quite frankly, uh, in episode one, should I be sitting here in my three piece suit? Uh, that's just not who I am. It's certainly not who Chris is. And it's certainly, quite frankly, not who the real FBI is. Uh, the FBI is really made up of men and women who, quite frankly, put their lives on the line each and every day. They get down and dirty. They deal with very, very, very dangerous people uh, and put themselves in very dangerous situations. And I just felt that I'm not going to sit here and here we go, not to bullshit you and try to uh, create an impression that because I'm a former FBI agent or practicing attorney, I should be sitting here in front of this mic wearing a suit and tie. And so this is what you see is what you get. And I'm hoping uh, that whether you're a young person, middle-aged person, older person, a male or a female, this program hopefully will challenge you, educate you, get you to think out of the box and really try to influence how you see the world. And most importantly, if we can attempt to keep you safer. And one of the things that's going to be a little different in this podcast, Chris, as you know, is that we have an email. It's on point with Stuart and Chris at gmail.com. And what we are asking is we want to invite the viewers to email us. Uh, email us with your ideas, your thoughts. Uh, your phone number. And if we like it or we think it's of interest and it's just not hate mail, we're probably going to reach out to you and maybe even invite you onto our program. Uh, because uh, Chris and I, we put our pants on just like everybody else. And we want to make this program about you. This program is about you. It's not about a hidden agenda. It's not about our political views we want to try to improve your lives as best we can. So, Chris, go ahead. Have at it. All right. Well, uh, just if I could uh, add one more bit of uh, just background. What, we want, what we're looking to do here is not give you an overly scripted, overly curated dialogue, right? Stu and I want to talk about things. We want to talk about things from an honest, objective and critical analysis view of what's going on, the issues in our lives. Uh, we live in a very interesting, complex, and somewhat concerning time right now. So we have a lot of material to work with day to day. And uh, as Stu said, we'd, we'd really like to get your perspectives, uh, offer your opinions and commentary, and share your experiences with us. Because not only will we be looking to share ideas, we look, we're looking to learn as well. Uh, we can cover current events, sensitive subjects, uh, political, economic, social. Uh, we will look into law enforcement, intelligence, and security areas, uh, legal world, uh, you name it, we'll talk about it. And uh, again, we're looking for your participation wherever possible. And uh, if you just want to sit back and listen and go for the ride, that's fine too, but it'd be a lot more fun for us if you would uh, give us some, some of your feedback and uh you know, while we're moving through the show and talking about different topics and segments. And, and so to that point, Chris, you know, one of the things that has really unnerved me and it has unnerved me for a long time in the last couple of years is this erosion of the inability for our United States government to insist that as Americans and we are the land of the free, and quite frankly, freedom has never been free, that that American flag, the United States national anthem, the erosion and the disrespect that people have shown, groups have shown, and the fact that there is even a discussion where men and women from the beginning of time uh, to the present, and even as we sit here today, Chris, and you know this, even as Americans are on foreign soil, dying, uh, putting their lives on the line 
for us so that even you and I can just have this conversation. And in any way that there are politicians or individuals or teachers or anybody that thinks in any way it is appropriate to show disrespect to the American flag or to the national anthem, I say, get lost, take a one-way trip, and leave the United States and find refuge in some other unforgotten place because you don't deserve to live here in the United States of America. No, I agree. And, uh, you know, I served in the military before my FBI time, and I have a military family, my my son, my daughter, my wife, uh, our parents. And, uh, you know, the American flag is a symbol of a, a lot of blood, sweat, tears, and sacrifice to make sure that we have the society we have. What makes me really, really unhappy, it pisses me off, is when I see young people openly, uh, I just say shitting on the flag and on the United States, the society that gives them their freedoms and their luxuries and their liberties. It's become cool to be a U.S. hater. And I think that our politicians are a bunch of shameful scumbags who promote this stuff. They promote the divisiveness that they, they, they actually give praise to people who are anti-American, anti-flag. And I think the people who are in positions of authority or in positions of official capacity, if they, if they don't like the flag, then keep your yap shut. That's it. Yeah. I mean, there are certain things that should be sacred. For example, you don't go into a church and shoot people in a church or a synagogue. You don't take the American flag if we're here in the United States and burn the flag or desecrate the flag. And Chris, when I saw this story in East Central Indiana, here you have a high school student, a young man who attached to his pickup truck is flying the American flag onto the school property. Now, when I went to school from the early days, we used to stand up and do the Pledge of Allegiance Absolutely. and face the flag, right? I mean, we can all relate to that. I'm sorry if you're you know, a younger person listening to this. You should listen to this because, quite frankly, you're ungrateful, you're spoiled, and somehow your mom and dad missed it because somehow they've empowered you to not show the proper respect. And what I would suggest is that you need to attend a funeral of some person that you don't know who got shot and killed in some unforgotten country so that you and I can have this conversation. And so here's this kid who goes to school and the principal somehow is more concerned that the flag is going to offend a certain population within that high school. He demands this kid to remove the flag from flying or being draped on his truck. Chris, what world am I living in? Uh, you know, it's still, it's not a good world, but I'll tell you what, I'm proud of that uh, 17 year old high school. Amen. Student. He stood his ground. He read the uh, policy manual, so to speak to the school administrators. There was nothing that barred him from flying his flag. Uh, they threatened him with insubordination. And, uh, the next day, a couple of dozen more kids had attached flag to their cars. And uh, again, very proud of those kids for even if it was just a show of defiance, but it was a show of defiance in the standing for the flag. And, and so, what I would say to anybody who disagrees or anybody who would not support this young man, clearly your ignorance is consistent with the fact that you have never left the United States of America and gone somewhere else to understand how privileged and how lucky we are as Americans to live here in the United States of America. And I would say it's just outrageous, Chris. They have no idea. I've been overseas. You've been overseas. I've been to some not so great places uh, in the world, uh, having worked in the counterterrorism arena, I've spent you know time in the Middle East and other parts of the world, and uh, 
there's no place like the United States. And I think a lot of these folks are spoiled. They lack perspective. And I think they've, they've become the result of what I see as a wave of leftist Marxist garbage that has been pushed through the education system for some years now. And, and that's, that's how it's done. They, they take over the education systems and, uh, this woke nonsense, this un-American thought process, it's shameful. These kids wouldn't last five minutes in some of the places overseas, you know, that, that we've seen. And uh, they're soft, they're weak, and they're entitled. And I'll tell you what, uh, what, what's worse, I don't blame the kids. We created, we allowed this environment to form as a society. Our education system is broken. Uh, the people in charge of it are cowards and uh, our, our, our politicians are just absolute zeros as human beings. Yeah. And Chris, you know, just to emphasize this point is I think everybody is familiar with this name. This poor girl in Georgia, Lakeland, Lakin Riley, mm-hmm. Lakin Riley. Yep. This is a girl who was living in Georgia, beautiful young lady, minding her business, went out for an afternoon jog, just like any other person should be able to do. And she is murdered, brutally murdered. Now, the bottom line is there is truth that I don't know, quite frankly, what the statistics are of a person who's here in the country illegally versus someone who's here legally as to truly what the odds are as to whether or not you're more likely to be murdered by someone who's here illegally or here legally. But the bottom line is, and the truth is, an illegal person who came here through Venezuela killed her, murdered her, brutalized her, and completely forever fucked her family up for the rest of their internal lives. Period. Well, this piece of human garbage who was allowed to enter the country by our own government ruined many lives with that action that he took. He murdered, assaulted, uh, just removed a human being from the world that should have gone on to do good things and help people. She was a nursing student from what I understand. And this piece of garbage came to the United States and committed a crime. He brought third world behavior to our country at the um, uh, I guess you can say not at the behest, but at the uh, ignorance of our own government officials. And it's it's a disgrace, it's a it's a shame. And and then you wonder why the people of the United States are looking now at their leaders with a certain sense of disdain and abandonment. And and, and Chris, when you have the president of the United States of America, the free land. Live free or die. The commander in chief get up in his state of a union dress last week. And listen, we can discuss forever whether or not his mental capacity is to the point where he's unfit to be the president. I'm not here to discuss that. It doesn't matter for this conversation. The bottom line is he said, and rightfully so, that the person that murdered Miss Riley was right. illegal, was here illegally. That's and correct. the fact that that son of a bitch the next day thought he had to apologize to whoever for saying the word illegal immigrant is, it defies logic, it oh. defies common sense, and it is so goddamn infuriating to me. Well, it shows you how far we've fallen as a society and what kind of cowards are in charge of our country. Uh, I believe the proper term, and I'm sorry if I'm sliding into your legal world, but the proper term is criminal alien. If he was going to correct himself, (laughs) he should have said, I'm sorry I called him an illegal. He's actually a criminal alien, right? That's the proper term. And uh, the fact that he felt it was necessary to go on television the next day and apologize only shows me that the people who really run the country— uh, gave him a call that night and told him he better fix it. I mean, who are we playing to? I mean, 
I, 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 if I was the mother and father of that poor girl, how do you keep it together when the person who is the leader of the free world gets up and wants to offer an apology to the murderer? Right. I, well, I, I'll tell you how. I'll tell you how, Stu, because there was a real leader, the former president of the United States, who was actually with her family offering condolences and offering sympathy for their loss. I, I, Chris, I, that is just one, I, I, you know, and by the way, again, online with, Stu, with Stuart and Chris at gmail.com. If you disagree with this, please email me, give me your phone number. I want to bring you on because I can't in any fashion wrap my head around well, anybody who can offer an excuse for the president to apologize to the murderer by calling him exactly, well, he didn't really call him what he is because, quite frankly, yeah. he's a piece yeah. of crap. But to apologize for calling him illegal, I, I, I just, I can't figure it out. Yeah, well, I don't think on any level you can excuse or justify what happened to that young lady and then the bad behavior of our, like you said, commander in chief, the chief executive of the United States of America behaving like that. It was cowardly. It was just, it was awful. You know, so Chris, and that gets me to kind of tap into your experience and quite frankly, the, the, the listeners, the viewers, I know are going to be very, very impressed with your background, your experience and what you saw and what you know. You worked under Chris Ray. I met with him every morning. Okay. And I know because you know that I know the assistant director presently. Paula Bate, um, who I worked with and I have the utmost respect for and a very, very high regard for. And I know as of yesterday, Chris Ray, the director of the FBI, is banging on the door, sounding the alarms to all of us and saying, people, wake up, wake up. Our borders are bringing in people that are going to massacre us, not isolated, not this bullshit lone wolf, single isolated event. No, no. So he's a bit, a bit too little, a bit too late. This has been going on for several years now. And, uh, and I have a little bit of, uh, I'd like to quote uh, from the director's testimony on Monday. Okay, he testified on Monday. And he said, from an FBI perspective, we are seeing a wide array of very dangerous threats that emanate from the border. And that includes everything from the drug trafficking that the FBI alone sees enough fentanyl in the last two years to kill 270 million people. And that's just the fentanyl side. An awful lot of violent crime in the U.S. is at the hands of gangs who are themselves involved in the distribution of fentanyl. And I'll finish with this. This fiscal year. Officials have so far encountered 58 immigrants at the southern border whose names appeared on the terrorist watch list, according to federal data. Well, if that's okay. not enough uh, to say to all of us, what are we doing? Because it's not if. It's just a matter of time when it's going to happen. I mean, it's going to happen. And what yeah. are we going to do? Do we have to look for an excuse as to why it happened? I, I think that the, the political environment right now is one of reactivity, cowardice. Uh, we're back to the political wrangling of times before 9-11. And uh, I'll tell you this, uh, also, you know, in the director's testimony, they said that 1.7 million immigrants, they believe, have entered the country entirely undetected. So you can probably double, maybe triple that number. OK, and I'll tell you another thing, Stuart, the 58 people who were encountered uh, whose names were on the terrorist watch list. Do you think those were serious people? Do you think those were people who were serious terrorist operators? No, they were the bottom feeders of the terrorist screening watch list. And the people who were serious operators who come here to do, uh, I would say, things that are not in our best interest and harmful to our communities. Those people will never be caught. They will never be encountered. I mean, I used to oversee the terrorist screening center, 
And I used to oversee the watch lists, several of them. And I will tell you now that the people who were encountered, those aren't the folks you're worried about. And they are well-funded and they know what they're doing and they know how to exploit our vulnerability. And, right. and, and, and I listen, ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't care whether you're Democrat, Republican, independent. I don't care if you're not political. It doesn't matter for this conversation. Right. The bottom line is we all want to live a life of peace and happiness and be safe. Listen, let's just assume the borders were closed and there were no illegal immigrants coming flooding through the border. Let's just assume that, Chris. Life as it is in the United States is difficult enough because of just certain things that we are all exposed to with respect to, you know, people, uh, lower class, middle class, upper class, uh, poverty, homelessness, mental health, drugs. I mean, that is ripe environment for crime. I I mean, those are all the things that make up the social friction in our country, right? I mean, all the things you just mentioned, not to mention the political jackassery that we have going on right now. Correct. So uh, I, 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 I couldn't tell you how, how just concerned I am about, especially I've worked in the national security arena for many, many years, and I can't tell you how concerned it makes me that we don't know who's coming across the border. Also, hey, I'll tell you another thing. Last year, they came up with tens of thousands of Chinese nationals who were flowing into the United States from Central America. Tens of thousands. And again, if they're willing to say tens of thousands, you can double or triple that number. So why are all these Chinese nationals entering the United States right now? Our main political and military adversary. They're not stupid. They see an opening. They see a strategic window that they can plant and seed people in our country, in our communities for maybe future intelligence or military purposes. And and Chris, I want to touch upon this because this is something that I see with my own kids. As you know, I have two young kids. And for those who are listening who have young kids like myself, And this is a perfect example of why it really should scare the crap out of you. You know, these kids grown up with their iPads and their smartphones and TikTok and Snapchat. That is their reality. Meaning when they get up, they're going online and whatever crap is being fed to them, they look at that as that is the way the world is. They don't understand, you know, true culture or discipline or respect or hard work or the fact that you have to earn it before it's given to you. I mean, all of these things are part and parcel to the environment that these kids are growing up in. Now, Chris, I never was more taken back, quite frankly. Now, listen, I grew up in New York. You know, I'm colorblind. I'm blind and and devoid to, you know, um, people's religion, uh, people's sexual orientation. Listen, the way I grew up in my family is my mother and my father only instilled basically one character, one most important character factor. Is the person a good person? Is their heart in the right place? Whether they're straight or gay or lesbian or black or white or Hispanic or Asian, that never, ever factored into the way I was raised. Now, when October 7th of 2023 happened, and that is the massacre that happened in Gaza to the Jewish people, to the Israelis. And for the first time in my lifetime, and if someone would have scripted this in a movie, I would have said, this is all fiction. This is not plausible. It's not possible. It's not intellectually comprehensible. But the fact that we saw the major academic institutions 
in the United States of America have presidents and deans and chairmen, head of these major universities, take the position of somehow being empathetic or sympathetic to justify what happened to Jewish people in Israel, quite frankly, is just not comprehensible. And I will tell the viewers that if you are my age and you have young kids, this is why I am scared to death for my kids because this was such a rude awakening for all of us to now have the curtain pulled down and realize our fucking kids are being indoctrinated by these assholes that are at the highest level of major universities. And I'm just pulling out major universities. You go down to high school, junior high school, elementary level, even further down. And this really should scare the crap out of all of us. And it does not matter whether you're pro-Israel, anti-Israel, whatever your position is. The fact that there are people that could justify the barbaric murdering, burning, raping, destroying, mutilating people on just one given day on October 7th and somehow say that it's excusable or that we are empathetic or sympathetic is just craziness. And Chris, I am telling you that there is no way, and again, if you disagree with what I'm going to say, write me and let me know. Listen, I said at the beginning of the program, freedom doesn't come free. There's a price to be paid for our freedom. And just like you and I can have this conversation today, that is why the United States is the greatest place on this planet. But if you are an elected official, if you are a congressman or a congresswoman or a senator or the president of the United States, you cannot and shall not have an anti-United States government view. Chris, do you remember when we applied to the FBI? What were one of some of the parameters with respect to the challenges of our fitness and our character to be eligible for the appointment to become an FBI agent? Well, it was a very difficult screening process between the the, the psychological and and the uh, interview process and and uh, if I remember right, when we moved through the the uh, process, to out of a hundred candidates, nine, about nine, between 90 and 94 of them draw, didn't make it to the end where we were standing and receiving our special agent credentials in a badge. Okay. So it was a very selective process. It was very, uh, you know why, Stu? Because we were the guardians of what made the United States what it is. I mean, we were, we're that, pra- the United States is, is, has to be guarded. Our ideals and our our principles have to be guarded, and that's not happening anymore. I mean, it, if nothing else, I mean, as you mentioned earlier, you know, our education system is teaching our children to hate the United States. They're they're putting hatred in the in, in the hearts of our kids, and they're and our our country is being demonized. And and I, and I'll tell you what bothers me the most is when I see these younger folks just talking about how we're a racist, uh, colonizing, all, you know, all the nonsense they put out there. This is the greatest country on the face of the planet. And why do you think tens and thousands of hundreds and thousands of people are flocking to our southern border to come here? If this was such a racist, horrible place, I don't see anybody beelining toward other places in the world, you know. (laughs) And by the way, Chris, quite frankly, here's a perfect opportunity for everybody who's listening. If you don't like it here, I'll tell you one country who would be more than willing to take you right now, and that would be Haiti. And I'll tell you what, I'm sure I could arrange for your one-way ticket to Haiti and see how you like it over there. Hey, Stu, I think they're probably getting good deals on tickets to Haiti right yeah, now. Right. I mean, and, and that's a perfect example of how we're so spoiled and we take it for granted. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, listen, 
I'm not trying to be on my soapbox and pontificate and say, you know, everything is perfect and the FBI is perfect and the government is perfect. No. And in particular, the government makes a lot of mistakes, but to me, the integrity, what it's supposed to look like, what it's supposed to be, should be beyond reproach. And we need to stand together. We need to be united. You know, Chris, I remember after 9-11, I mean, talk about really the United States coming together. I mean, it was hard to see a car on a local street or going down the highway without some sort of American flag. Do you remember that? I mean, you almost were embarrassed if you didn't have a decal or a flag. Well, I do remember it and everybody was scared. And when people are scared, they love their Uncle Sam. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just how it is. They were scared. They didn't know what was going on. And uh, we have short memories. And I think that memory is going to get jogged a little bit here in the near future. You mentioned Haiti. Uh, right now, Haiti is is sinking into a post-apocalyptic environment, which shows you what happens when the rule of law and the government fails. When you so badly want to destroy the systems and the institutions that keep society running. And that's what you're seeing in Haiti right now. Gangs and criminals are in charge. Dead bodies laying around the streets. People are being brutalized. They're talking about cannibalism. I mean, all of this type of stuff, military folks are down there evacuating embassy personnel. Now, I'm waiting to see when they have to go in and actually do extractions to get U.S. citizens or other I would say partner nation nationals out of areas that they can't move safely from. So it's ugly down there. And that's what people in this country don't understand. And we've gotten so spoiled and you get a lot of the folks mostly out, you know, in the, in the, in the, I would say the liberal areas, they want to tear down the society. They want to tear down the system. Well, take a look at Haiti. That's what you're asking for. And, And Chris, you know, Hopefully it will never happen and it won't happen in Haiti. But as you touched upon it, our only our own military assets, our men and women are going to go down there mm-hmm. and our position there to do extractions. And God help us all. If one of them gets injured or killed, what we're going to have people in the United States desecrate the American flag right. and show disrespect to that man or woman or that family. Cause we are so goddamn spoiled not to appreciate the sacrifice and the risk of Americans going down to Haiti and it caused them to lose their life. And we are so self-centered to think that it is better to desecrate the American flag or the national anthem. Again, for all you people who kneel during the national anthem or think it's the, the cool thing, to sit during the national anthem. Listen, get on a get on a flight, go down to Haiti, and kneel down there and see how you like it down there yeah. because yeah. you don't deserve to have a seat no. in the United States of America. No, like I said earlier, the blood, sweat, and tears that went into protecting that flag and the ideals that it stands for, that gives us the freedoms that we have. And you'll see behind me, of course, you'll see I love the American flag. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. Right. But I'll tell you what, what's happening right now is there's a full scale attack from the left, from the Marxist movements and the communist movements. They're here and they've infiltrated. And everybody, when you mention communism, they all roll their eyes. And, and you mentioned Marxism, they roll their eyes. I'll tell you what, Stu, I read a book called The Naked Communist. I recommend everybody read it. And it'll tell you there are about 50 steps that the communists put together in the 1950s, 1950s. And they've done them all. And if you look at them, you see it all around you. It's amazing. They just didn't stick around long enough to see their plan come true. It's crazy. So, Chris, let's move on to a lighter subject. There is there a lighter subject? Well, let's talk about biological men and women. All Let's right, talk right. about yeah. a, a, a person who was came into this world as a boy, as a, as a boy, right? right? And at some point, this boy decides, for whatever reason, however he's wired, he feels more in tune or closer to or simulates to being a woman. Okay. Right. And just like I said, I don't really care. If you're a boy and you want to dress up as a woman 
or you want to change yourself to become from the outer, look like a woman and, and, and do hormone replacement, I, I, God bless you, does not affect me. I'm supportive of that. You have the right to do that. Amen to you. But here's where I draw the line. When that boy decides, I want to play golf, he will readily and easily start to realize that as a boy, you're generally going to be able to drive that golf ball during your tee shot further than most girls. I didn't say every time. Please, viewers, I'm not saying there, there isn't the exceptions. But generally, when a man tees off a golf ball, it goes further than a woman. By way of example, when you go out to play golf, the tees are situated differently. There are the professional tees, and then there are the amateur tees, and then there are the male tees, and then there are the female tees. I mean, because it recognizes that women don't hit the ball as far or drive the ball as hard or as far as a, as a man. Okay. Who cares? It's just a fact of life. Okay. Hey, Stu, well, let, me, let me throw something in here. Go for ahead. You. Nature created differences between men and women. When it comes to speed and power, men will generally have an advantage. That is a given. It's because of the way we're made. It's because of the way nature and the good Lord put us here. All right. And if you're right, there are exceptions at times, but it seems like we have a movement in the country or around the world, actually. It's kind of a global contagion. But thinking that women and men can compete equally in places, and I'm sure everybody's seen all the examples on the Internet of women just being horribly either beaten badly or injured badly when competing against men where speed and power are the two primary components. I'm not talking about uh, finesse activities. Correct. Right? I'm not talking about putting or taking yeah. a chip shot out of the sand. Finesse activities. Correct. Right? And, and, and so, and Chris, so where I live, uh, my wife has a friend and their daughter, I think she's 16 or 17. And from what I understand from the very beginning of her life, she took on playing golf and all she does is play practice and play golf. She actually is on the high school golf team. Her father and mother travel around the country and they take her to one tournament to the other. And eventually I think they're in pursuit or she's in pursuit of getting a scholarship to go to college on a golf scholarship. How would it be in any way fair to now have this girl have to compete with a boy who now says, I'm associating with being a girl. Yeah, I'm a boy. Not, I've been a boy for 15 years, and now I'm going to change hats, and I'm going to identify as a girl. And how is it right to allow that boy to compete against this girl for her entire life has been practicing and playing to be the top of her field or her, her team as a female and now think it's okay to allow this boy who identifies as a girl to play against her. It's, it's not okay. Okay. Hey, hey, I've seen instances where female athletes have, I mean, the fairly elite female athletes who are looking for scholarships, they're looking for opportunities that go along with their chosen sports, maybe professional opportunities, what have you. They are beaten out of those opportunities by mediocre male participants who now have identified as something other than what they are. Uh, but these females have been cheated and beaten out of opportunities and no one is upset about it. And, and no one have a bunch of virtue signaling shit bags who are proud of themselves because this mediocre guy beat this girl out of a, an opportunity. And, and, and Chris, I don't really care if that boy wants to identify as a girl. I, I, God bless him. That's fine. And by the way, I'm fully supportive. But here's what I say. You have boy sports, you have girl sports. And okay. if we have to have a third category of transgender sports, yeah. Yeah. so be it. I don't really care. You know, but, but to 
impact or change the course or the direction right. of life for people that have basically, you know, sacrificed everything. For example, I have a neighbor of mine, her, her, their daughter is a competitive swimmer. And Chris, when I tell you this girl gets up at 430 in the morning, she swims before school. She swims at school. She swims after school. I mean, she lives and breeds swimming. That is the dedication and the commitment that she has decided to put into her career as far as being a competitive swimmer. Right. Top, How, she's one of the top echelon. Athletes. Correct. Right. How unfair would it be for some kid who boy now to say, uh, uh, I'm a girl now, so I'm going to, I'm going to swim against this same girl. I mean, who would not be appalled and oh. stand up ladies and gentlemen for the girl to say, yeah. it's not fair. This girl has sacrificed everything to become the top competitive swimmer, female swimmer. And if this boy wants to come to the pool and put on a bikini or a one piece bathing suit and look like a girl, I don't really care, but let him swim with other similarly situated people. Don't let him swim against a female swimmer because that's cheating. And that's not fair. Stu, when I was a kid, if you competed with the girls, I mean, you were mercilessly tormented by the rest <laughs> of the dudes. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it, you know, the values have just changed over the years. And it's this woke nonsense that's going on that promotes this stuff. And they pat themselves on the back, the social justice warriors, and how, how brave they are. And I'm thinking, that's not brave. It's not brave to go and compete against females who you know you can beat when you're a mediocre male athlete. I mean, I just saw where uh, uh, the lady who got famous for this whole scenario that Riley Gaines, she was on another podcast, very famous Joe Rogan podcast. And uh, and she was talking about and one other time I saw her speak where she said I was an elite top of the line swimmer. And she said my boyfriend, who was also a swimmer, was kind of a mid grade swimmer. And she said he could beat her. Every time they raced without even trying hard. Yeah. And, it, and, and it's defeatist. I mean, just think of how defeatist yeah. that would be if she would have to compete as a woman well, against him. Right. Yeah. Well, she's competing against a trans male yeah. or a trans female as it is. And and that's why she was saying like, her, she knows that she can't beat these people. Yeah. And she was the top swimmer. This wokeness, it's a cancer and it's going to ruin Everything it touches, it already has in our country. And uh, I'll tell you, Stu, uh, the and uh, well, I'll, I'll just say this: I know we were talking about having a woke watch, where we where we look for wokeism and woke nonsense to just keep people aware. And uh, I just want to throw it out there for uh, the conversation. We talked about that VA official, the Veterans Administration. Yeah. Uh, she was an undersecretary. I'll give her her props, Rima Ann uh, Nelson. It's all over the internet, so I'm not betraying her confidence. Uh, but she wanted to remove that iconic victory in Japan image of the sailor uh, having a kiss with the lady in Times Square on Victory in Japan Day, World War II ended. Right? It was a time of elation. It was a time of great hope. Uh, it, it signified the the youth and the energy of our nation. And this person, uh, Miss Nelson decided that it wasn't inclusive and that it was uh, it was not in line with the uh, department's zero tolerance against harassment and assault. Yeah. She, was, he, she said that this woman was kissed against her will. So she ordered that all images would be taken down in every VA facility. This woman who is just, to me, another one of these social justice jerks who never did anything on her own, just decided this because she had some kind of uh, a, a bureaucratic power. Now that was turned over by the actual VA secretary said, no, we're not going to do that. But what else has this lady done? What other decisions has she made? And these people in leadership roles, Stu, it burns me up. I mean, it makes me, it, it puts me through the ceiling daily. When I see these woke clowns in leadership roles, all they do is cause problems. They're divisive. These progressive idiots whining, complaining, 
They're not focused on the job, and all they do is push Marxist social justice garbage in the and I'll tell you what, in my opinion, in this instance, the VA is an abysmal, troubled organization, and they should worry more about providing top shelf care and treatment to our veterans. Amen. The people who fight the wars for this country, who give life and limb literally. And this woman's worried about some picture being offensive. Yep. I so, agree. I mean, that's the world we live in, my yep. friend. Chris, I'm getting a. a- a clue from our uh, director here that we're running out of time, but well, Hey, let me do this too. Go ahead. Let me do this, buddy. I got a couple of things on a speed round. Uh Oh, go ahead. Let me fasten my seatbelt. Go ahead. A couple of items for you. Go ahead. All right. Speed round. We're going to do a little life by the number. Oh boy. All right. Tell me what number this means to you. 77%. All right. Time's up. Go ahead. Of people between ages 17 through 24 who would be eligible for military service in the United States, 77% of them are not fit for duty. What are they, too fat? Well, here are the top reasons. (laughs) Obesity. (laughs) All right, so I got it right. Yep, physically unfit. Yeah. Mental health problems and drug abuse. Well, listen... (laughs) I mean, tell me, tell me if that doesn't say it all right there. Well, listen, you know what we could do? We could just hand out Osempic to the seventy-seven percent. They'll all lose the weight, and then we got them, right? All right. Let me give you, let me give you two more, Stu. Go ahead. How about nine times? I don't. What is it attached to? All right, nine times. This is. We have approximately seven hundred to eight hundred thousand sworn law enforcement officers in the United States. There are nine times, approximately, the number of migrants who have entered the United States since this administration has come in place. So for every one police officer, there are nine migrants. Well, well, are you being politically correct by calling them migrants? I Uh, am. (laughs) I am. I'm trying to be respectful. All right. So what you're saying is people... I'm trying to follow after our chief executive. All All right. So that's undocumented people... We have nine times, to- the, the population is nine times our total law enforcement community. That's correct. That's well, excellent. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, That if that doesn't concern you, then I guess here's nothing the, will. Here's the last one for the speed round, Stu. Go ahead. 5.5 times. Go ahead. That is the number of illegal migrants for each military member. Jesus. We have 1.3 million active duty military members as of 2023. And if you take the numbers, we just talked about the estimates. Again, I think they're a lot higher, but the estimates, we have 5.5 migrants for every one active duty military person in the United States. Excellent. So Excellent. That, that is are... outstanding, isn't it? <laughs> that makes me feel warm and fuzzy. But look, yeah. Chris, we just gave our viewing audience a little taste, yeah. hopefully, Hopefully I didn't lose anybody yet. Uh, Look, we are going to touch upon just about every subject out there. And and Chris, and and this is why I love you, because you and I will keep it real uh, with an understanding that, look, we don't preach the gospel. We just want to be on point and be frank with you. And obviously not everybody's going to agree with our take. But that is why, again, and I'm going to say on point with Stuart and Chris at gmail.com. And Stuart is S-T-U-A-R-T. I am inviting you. Send me your email. Send me your phone number. We'll include you. I want to hear from you. Right. Hey, Stu, before we close it out, I'd like to hit a couple of gratitude points and one remembrance. Yes, sir. All right. So uh, for our show, uh, we'd like to thank all of the law enforcement first responders, our military Basically, in the, anyone who keeps society running every day in spite of everything that you're fighting against, we want to thank you for your continued effort. Amen. And uh, I also want to recognize the passing of uh, former FBI deputy director. His name was Mark Giuliano. He served as the number two guy in charge of the FBI from about 2012 through 2016. He passed away on the 2nd of March. He was 62 years old. He had a surprise heart attack. He wasn't ill. 
and uh, you know, I just want to yeah. tell Mark farewell and uh, give my condolences to his family. And I concur with that. And, and Chris, I want to say something before we, we 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 close because you touched upon our law enforcement community. You know, ladies and gentlemen, or anybody that's listening, most of the time, our interaction with law enforcement, fortunately, is basically just an encounter over a routine traffic stop. You get stopped for not wearing your seatbelt, using your cell phone, speeding, whatever. And I would admit probably most of the time it's not a pleasant experience because generally you're probably going to drive away or get a ticket. Okay, I get it. But I have to tell you that that is 1% of generally the interaction that our law enforcement, our men and women have with the general public because 99% of their day in and day out is dealing with bad people. And when I say bad people, they're put into bad situations. They're dealing with homeless people. They're dealing pe- dealing with people that are suffering from mental health issues. They are called on to domestic situations. They're called into shooting situations. They're called into the worst of humanity. And that is what they deal with 99% of the time. And that is why, fortunately, most of us can go about our daily lives and feel safe and secure in our neighborhoods because of the men and women who sacrifice so much and deal with such craziness to keep us safe. And if there's any favor that I would ask of any of you, the next time you see a man or woman in uniform, I don't care if it's a, you know, firefighter, EMT, police officer, go up to them and just say, I just want to let you know, I appreciate what you do. And I just want to thank you because I just want to let you know that will forever shape them and have them also pause and say, They don't feel that most of us take them for granted because a lot of cops feel like we take it for granted. We take them for granted. We shit on them and we don't necessarily thank them for the sacrifices that they really honestly made. And so if I could ever ask for a favor, when you see the next time you see a cop or a person in uniform, go up to them and just tell them you appreciate what they do. I'm telling you, it will be so appreciated. Makes makes a difference. Amen. uh, Hey. Last word, remember, these are people who leave their families every day to protect yours. And that is so true. And sometimes they don't come home. And sometimes we don't stop and pause and really understand, man, they they have kids, they have wives, they have husbands, they have nieces and nephews and friends and family. And it does mess with them and mess their families up and impact their children. And we need not take that for granted. Chris. I love you like a brother. I'm looking forward to episode two. I think we'll slow down the tempo. We'll talk about uh, some other topics and ourselves and give the viewing audience a little bit more insight as to who we are and what we do. Absolutely, Stu. Thank you. And uh, thanks to the team there. And I hope to come and film a few episodes with you guys on site here shortly. So uh, thanks to everybody and uh, see you in episode two. All right. Good night.